Hi, I'm Adam Natale, director of SVA Theater at the School of Visual Arts. If you've never heard of SVA, we're a preeminent art and design college in New York City. Check the description below for more info. Since 2014, SVA Theater has hosted After School Special, the college's annual alumni film and animation festival. The festival is normally a series of free screenings followed by Q and A's with alumni who are successfully working in the film industry. Even though we're unable to host in-person screenings this year, we're thrilled to be able to present interviews with over 25 alumni who've worked on a wide variety of feature films, television shows, documentaries, animated films, and more. Whether tonight's Q&A focuses on a particular series, film, or other work, we'll be sure to note it in the description below and we'll provide info on how to watch. All of our festival interviews will premiere here on YouTube during the week of September 21st. We're calling this our work from home edition of After School Special, and our guests are zooming in from all over the world, from Singapore and Germany to Canada and California. A full schedule of After School Special 2020 interviews can be found at svatheater.com, but all videos will remain on YouTube following their premieres. I hope you enjoy tonight's interview, and if you're interested in viewing past After School Special Q&As, you can visit the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in and fingers crossed, we hope to see you in person at an SVA theater event in the near future. I'd like to welcome Alexa Karolinski, who graduated from SVA's MFA social documentary program in 2011. Her thesis film became her breakout film, Oma and Bella, which follows two Holocaust survivors, her grandmother being one, as they cook and discuss their experiences. The film premiered at the Berlin Film Festival, winning the prestigious Grimma Prize and also inspired a very popular cookbook. Alexa's second documentary, Signs of Life, was released in 2018 to critical acclaim with Der Spiegel calling it the German Jewish work of its generation. Alexa has collaborated with the fashion brand Eckhaus Latta and with writer artist Ingo Neerman, and her videos have been shown at major festivals and museums throughout the world, including MoCA Los Angeles, MoMA PS1, and Centre Pompidou. And for the main reason we're here tonight, Alexa co-created, wrote, and produced the Netflix miniseries Unorthodox with Anna Winger, based on Deborah Feldman's memoir. The series premiered earlier this year to critical acclaim and was recently nominated for eight Emmy Awards. Alexa is one of those nominees in the category of Outstanding Limited Series, so I'd love to congratulate and welcome Alexa Karolinski. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and you're in Berlin right now, which is one of the settings of the show. Um, I strongly recommend that people watch the show. It's easy to watch in one sitting. It's four episodes, three and a half hours. Um, I flew through it. So congratulations again on all the success. Um, we're, we're thrilled that you're an al alumna of SVA. So I'd love for you to start by telling us a little bit about your SVA experience. Absolutely. Um... I have to go back a couple of years. Basically, I, um, I originally, I studied history of art as an undergrad. And um, through my work experience, I worked at Vice, I worked at Arte, a French German TV station, and really got interested in moving image and uh, into in documentary. And, and um, the, the way the, there's a, a pretty steep ladder that you need to climb in order to make documentaries if you didn't go to film school, essentially. And for me, it just, um, I, I was working at Arta at the time, making and writing and directing these three minute culture reports. This is pre-internet video. So um, the format of a three minute, of a three minute anything was still pretty foreign anywhere else. Um, and so uh, I decided to apply and eventually go uh, to um, SVA to its um, SOC doc program, the social documentary program to um, learn how to film things myself, how to kind of be really resourceful and not be dependent on anybody else to, to make something. Um, and at the time I was, um, a, a, a true documentary, a documentarian at heart, and so um, I I was part of the first class that um, 
of the first SVA SOC doc program. And so um, I feel like it was a really special time because the program was still kind of figuring out really what it is and what it needs to be. And we were sort of the, the, the lab rats for the program. So there was a lot of freedom, but also um, a lot of work. And uh, I met some of my closest friends there and my collaborators, we still work together there. And it was a really wonderful, magical experience. It was also the first time I ever lived in the US, um, in New York. And, um, and yeah, I've, I've made, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. I'm very grateful for it. Uh, and as I mentioned, your thesis film was Oma and Bella, which was a true success right out of right out of school. It launched your career. Can you tell us a little bit about the the film and and you know I know it played some festivals, so sort of where it went after you graduated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was funny at the time when when we kind of had to decide our, our thesis project uh, at at SVA. Um, I sort of I had a couple of ideas. But one of the things I just randomly did is, is when I was visiting my family in Berlin, I filmed my, um, really just for some practice. I, and because and my grandmother and her best friend, Bella, who, who moved in, into one apartment after their husbands died and spent their days um, cooking Jewish food. Um, and, I, and I loved spending time with them and I was learning how to cook from them, um, filmed them. And it was really, funny and I kind of um when I when I had to when I pitched my different ideas for a thesis film this was sort of my half nonchalant like oh there's also this thing I don't know what it is and I showed it to Mara Shamayev the head of the program and Deborah Dixon and a couple of other professors and everybody was like you know this is this is your thesis project, right? And I was like okay well if you think so <laughs> um and that and then it kind of build in this really beautiful life experience. It, it allowed me to really spend so much time with them and get to know them and make this film and have advisors that belong to some of the best documentarians in the country or maybe in the world. And um, yeah, and, and so I made um, a, fe a feature length thesis project um, called Oman Bella. It um, premiered at the Berlin Film Festival, and and it really, it really traveled the world. I didn't travel the world with it. I went to a couple of festivals, like the big um, documentary festivals, like Hot Docs, um, and uh, it, it just, you know, in a way, it, it had the best. Uh, what, what you would want for a documentary, where it just kind of took on its own life and. Um, and 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 yes, as you said, you know, I, I raised the money for for to finish the film via Kickstarter, and this was early Kickstarter early days. Um, this was right in the beginning of Kickstarter, and as one of the um, gifts, basically, I, I I promise a cookbook, which is how I ended up making a cookbook. But and I and I self published it, but then I've since sold out of three editions. It's been that that's been an old. I, I've stopped because. I can't be a cookbook distributor. You, you know, you worked on some documentaries following that, and you did created some video art as well. But uh, this, you know, looks to be your first narrative series. And so, you know, was were you planning to get into narratives, or was you know sort of how how has the arc of your career led you to narratives? Yeah, um, I feel like everything has been very organic. I, um, I graduated SVA and I was kind of trying to figure out how I can make a living and how I can be a professional filmmaker. And, and this is early days of, I mean, this is early days of, of, of internet video. I mean, now it's just such a natural part of our internet experience, of our social media experience, but we tend to forget that only 10 years ago, most of the places we watch our videos didn't really exist. Um, and at the time it was like, okay, what is commercial video? What does it mean? And I just, I had friends in the fashion industry um, and, and that's kind of how I got into having jobs. And, and it merged with documentary in this way because a way to get into fashion video was to shoot behind the scenes videos at shoots for photographers or certain designers. And then 
that kind of spun into, okay, let's make collection videos. And I feel like even though um, I moved a little bit away from the documentary genre, I feel like um, a certain type of storytelling um, that is is rooted in documentary down to unorth the way unorthodox was made. Um, I, you know, I, um, I find the term hybrid a bit difficult, but I, I do believe that filmmaking to some extent is pretty fluid and um, formats and genres exist mostly for distribution. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I never made a choice. It, it was more just that I, I, I got more and more interested in other forms of storytelling, not necessarily just documentary versus narrative. I also got interested in what can you do in the realm of art video when it can be a bit more ethereal, a bit more meditative. Like trying to figure out where do different types of storytelling belong, right? Um, because you can't really reinvent the wheel, but what you can do is kind of figure out where everything exists, but where do these things exist? And how, what does it mean to tell a certain type of story a certain way? And, and, and where can I go to do that? Because um, again, you, you can't reinvent how, you know, how the systems work in a way, but you can, you can in a way try to cr crack it. Um, so, so I feel, so I feel like that's kind of, that's kind of what happened. I decided commercial video would be a really fun place for me because I can make money and I can um, learn, use different kind of storytelling. I can work, I can collaborate with a lot of people because I really do love filmmaking for collaboration and sometimes documentary filmmaking can be a little bit lonely because um, teams are really small. Some people work almost without a team. I made Oma and Bella with a minuscule team. I, I mo did most of it myself. Um, and then it's just, you know, what type of story d deserves what type of storytelling? And, um, and I think ultimately the reason why I moved a little bit away from pure documentary is because I figured out for myself that the way for me to earn money was to do branded documentaries. And to me, that felt like the worst compromise yeah. um, because I felt, okay, well, if I'm working I don't mind working for brands, but I don't want a type of storytelling or genre that to me is about some form of truth to, to do that. And I've done my, my share of branded documentaries. And I just remember doing these artist portraits for a big brand and eventually me just thinking, you know, I actually want to be the artist. I don't want to, I don't want to be, um, trying to think about how to visualize the artist's visuals. Um, and I wanna do it myself. And, uh, you know, I did another documentary that I needed to do to work through some of my own things in my own German Jewish identity. And um, along the way, I met Anna Winger, who um, is a wonderful storyteller and showrunner. And she had made the show uh, Deutschland, 83, 86, and 89 is about to launch. And um, she, we just really hit it off and, and just um, um, kind of decided at some point we should really think about doing something together. And her knowing that I had never had any experience in TV writing said, um, I mean, I try to write a couple of scripts, but you know, when you're, when you're tapping around in the dark, it's sometimes a bit hard to find where to go. And Anna basically was like, you know, and where she's right is, is it's, you can learn the tools. It's more about your ideas and, and you, and your ability to funnel the ideas into structure that works. And that's how documentary works as well. I mean, in a way, narrative is like the inverse of documentary because with documentary, you start off with essentially all this footage you shot and you need to condense it into a story that works and narrative works the exact opposite where you construct the story and that builds into the big production. Um, so I think to me, it just comes down to a real interest in storytelling and, and how, you can, um, how you can tell different stories. And I think, um, you know, one thing that I really love about narrative storytelling 
is that you can ex really explore you can you can really explore all different types of characters and merge characters and just create things and become those things you know you need to become the characters in order to write them and i and i feel like that's a really fun exercise especially when they're a bit evil you know sure um so between you and Anna, who discovered Deborah Feldman's memoir and, and did one of you take it to the other person or? Yeah, well, what happened was um, Deborah Feldman lives in Berlin and her son goes to the same American high school as Anna's kids. They're around the same age. And I just remember one day Anna was like, you know, in, in our many conversations was like, you should, there's this woman in my school, this mom in my school, who lives in Berlin and who wrote this best-selling novel on Orthodox, you should read it. And this was not about a project yet at all. It was more just, you should read this. And I was like, wow, I've never, I can't believe that this person would live in Berlin. And, uh, you know, we both read it and we were still talking about a very different project that had nothing to do with unorthodox. And I think the mix of us reading it and all of us kind of becoming friends and to be fair, Deborah very early on was like, please, you two, can you just turn on Orthodox into something? And both of us were a little bit resistant in the beginning, especially because we wanted to make something in Berlin. Sure. And uh, all of Unorthodox is set in New York and New York State. And of course, the end product is very different than the book. Um, and uh, I, and unorthodox kind of um, just came up a lot, and then and then the imagination started to spin. It's like, okay, what if we do unorthodox? But what if she comes to Berlin? You know, what if? How can we tell these things that we're trying to tell in this other thing we're planning? But what if we did it through this? And then the kind of fun taking the pieces apart, and you can only do that if if you're if you're working with a writer of a book who's open to do that. Um, it, it's not necessarily common that people take a book and then really reinvent 70% of the show. Um, you know, every big decision we made, um, we ran by Deborah and Deborah really trusted us. So um, that's how, how we really changed a lot. Was there ever a moment in the creative process, you know, specifically you being a documentarian where you thought this could make a great documentary or was it always sort of the idea of, going towards a narrative structure? Well, actually the documentary exists, right? It's called One of Us, it's on Netflix and another SVA alum who I was in yeah. class with, Jenny Morello, was the DP on that. So- um, And we showed that the other year in our alumni festival, but is that, I mean, is that based on Deborah's story as well? I know it's, no, it's generally not, it's, the story. It's, it's generally the story. Sure. Um, the truth of the matter is, 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 you know, with these, with an insular community like this one, and um, you can't really interview the ex, the ex-husbands and wives, you know, and the leaders and all this stuff. Um, there are limitations to what you can do. Um, but if you really want to, like for us, it was really important to, we wanted to go deep into this community and show it. Um and explore certain questions that you could only do. I mean, I don't think documentary and narrative are in competition with each other, right? Uh, I don't, I don't, I think any story can be turned into either more, more or less, right? Sure. Um, with certain different approaches, of course, but, you know, I think um, depends what kind of documentarian you are, right? Um, um, but, you know, um, so no, it, it, it never, it actually, it, it really started off with Anna and me wanting to write a show um, and then Unorthodox coming onto our lives. It was never about, we want to do Unorthodox and should this be a doc or a narrative? It was never, sure. it was never like that. And so I, I will plug, you know, one of us, it is a terrific documentary also on Netflix. And, and as you mentioned, another social documentary alum, Jenny Morello, was the cinematographer on that. And if you want to uh, search on YouTube, there is a Q&A with her from after school special a year or two ago. And, uh, and it's a great Q&A, so I encourage you to watch that. 
Um, so, you know, you, you clearly were looking for a story that you could uh, shoot and tell from, you know, in, in Berlin. And so the story is split between Berlin and New York, which are, you know, two of the cities that you lived a good chunk of your life in. So can you talk about that experience working between, between the two cities? Sure. I mean, um, to be fair, we only shot in New York for two and a half days. Okay. Um, all the interiors are shot in Berlin, even though they're set in New York. Okay. That's the um, TV magic of it all, <laughs> is that we created those here. Um, and uh, of course, I've lived in New York and, and we, we took some extensive research trips and we're in people's homes and, and, and our research trips were really important. And I, I would feel like this is possibly the documentarian in me is, is that authenticity was just a really important factor. Um, and uh, it's not a documentary, we're telling a story, but at, at, at the end of the day, um, we did want to show something that felt real. And for that, we also had to put her into a world that felt real. Um, yeah, and uh, so yeah, we only shot in New York and for two and a half days. And I have to admit, I wasn't at that shoot because it was at the tail end of our entire shoot. And I was actually pregnant during out the entire making of Unorthodox and was literally in labor um, during our rap party. Okay. So I, I didn't make it to New York on the tail end of the shoot, but um, it's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but well, it did, but it did often feel very surreal because we suddenly had, you know, um, Berlin doesn't really have a Hasidic Jewish community like New York at all. So we'd have these scenes of, of all these extras dressed up and in the middle of Berlin, it was really surreal. It never felt like New York in this way, although the interiors sometimes were mind blowing. I mean, we built a set of Estes like marriage apartment that's supposed to be in a, in a, in a, um, you know, in a really, in a high rise and, um, walking in, I was just like, wow. I mean, the detail, our production designer, Zilka Fisher just blew it out of the water. Yeah. The production design, the costumes are great. I mean, this, this is why it's nominated for, for eight Emmys. It's, uh, it's <laughs> so, so exacting. And, uh, and so, you know, did you have any direct experience with the Hasidic Jewish community, either, you know, in New York or elsewhere before you started writing this? Well, I guess it depends, like, what we define as Hasidic, not to get into the weeds of it, but um, I have not never had any experience with the Satmar community, which is the community that we focus on in the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is um, Chabad, a pretty big organization that um, defines itself as Hasidic, though I think Satmar people would say they're not Hasidic. I mean, I'm uh, not even going to get right. into that. And they're in Berlin and a and, and, and bit... Um, They welcome all Jews of all directions. Um, sure. But um, so the answer is not really, to be honest. I mean, my my Jewish experience in life couldn't be more different. Um, and, um, you know, one of the most essential people we hired very early on was Ellie Rosen, who was our, um, who's an ex Hasidic um, translator, coach, consultant. And he, he ended up also playing our rabbi. And, um, and, and we owe him a great deal of the authenticity. And um, we casted as many ex Hasidic people with this experience, with a similar experience to Deborah as we could, you know, just to learn. Yeah, and I mean, the cast is, is exceptional. Uh, Shira Haas in the lead, and then the two actors who play uh, Yankee and Moisha are, I, I mean, the, the trio of them, as well as the, the supporting cast are all outstanding. Um, you know, so, so to speak about the, that sect of the Jewish community a little bit more, you know, films, uh, whether they be documentaries or narrative uh, about religious sects can tread on kind of dangerous water and can easily become a sort of condemnation of a particular religion or culture. So how do you feel that you walk that fine line so that the audience understands that community and doesn't necessarily brand the entire culture as sort of bad or evil? I mean, the series makes it pretty clear that while there are some 
bad guys or bad actors. There are several people from the community who are trying to do their best within the strict rules of the culture. So, so how do you feel you walk that line and, uh, and do you feel that the final product was, you know, that you put out was what you intended when you started? Um, I think, you know, I think once you finish a, once you finish work, it never really is exactly what you imagined in the beginning, but then I don't know, I, I kind of, you know, for you forget what, what you set out with. Um, you know, I think for us, the guiding tool was always that it's about her and her experience and it's about our characters. And it's not, we're not setting out to say something about an entire community. We're some, we're saying something and honoring her journey. And, um, you know, um, it really, I guess, depends on who you ask, because there are people who believe we did do that. Um, I, I think we, we try to approach it as generous as possible. Also understanding that the specific community is rooted in some really deep trauma. Um, and, you know, um, and that's something, you know, I didn't grow up Hasidic at all, but I am the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. So I do understand um, the base, it's the same trauma, that's the basis. The difference is that these people um, created an entire community and lives around the trauma, right? Um, and that's really interesting to me. I don't think that necessarily justify any type of uh, oppression of anyone, um, but it is something interesting to explore, right? Um, so I, I feel like that was the start off point, and I, you know, and uh, there, there's not there's not one thing in this show that isn't justifiable through um, the character's journey, you know, um, and and I think that that's kind of where it comes from, you know. There are little hints here and there that maybe tell like make a larger point, but um, you know, for us, it was really important to create complicated characters. You know, um, that her husband Yankee is a kind of you know, could we have made him abusive? This that like sure, you you can do anything to make a point like but it was just more interesting to us to create a character who um, doesn't know better, you know, who is also a victim of the system he grew up in, right? Or a character like Moisha, right? Who, sure, he, he's not a good guy, but he's also a really tragic guy at the same time in a way mm -hmm. he can't really exist in any, in either of the worlds. You know, he, in the end of the day, probably won't have an happy ending because he can't live in the Hasidic world and he really doesn't know, he's, he has a gambling addiction and doesn't really know how to make it work in the like real world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that just felt, you know, that, that approach is just a bit more interesting, you know, um, like things that are a bit more ambiguous than just, you know, um, yeah, just a clear cut good and evil thing is just not is just not that interesting to watch. I think. Absolutely, and I and I think that that's very clearly seen throughout the series. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, you're right, especially you know with with her husband, and and that comes through in his performance. Is that it's it it is this sort of tricky balance that that they're playing, you know, in, in his life, and you can understand why there's you know. I don't want to say a lack of understanding, but you clearly can see with his performance and with the writing that he's unsure of of how to live his life almost. Um, and uh, it does make it a lot more interesting. Um, so, you know, once the show once the show was completed, was it at that point? Everyone wants to know how Netflix got involved. Everyone wants to be on Netflix. So was Netflix involved from the beginning? Was did you shop it around once it was complete? No, Netflix was involved from the more or less the beginning. Um, you know, it's not easy to sell a show that's half in Yiddish. 
and shot in Berlin <laughs> with New York interiors. Sure. And, um, and Netflix Germany at the time um, that had launched not too long before wanted German content. And um, I mean, I, I need to hand it to them that they took this knowing that the main language is Yiddish and, and international English, essentially. Mm -hmm. they, they were the only ones who were willing to take this route with us. Um, and yeah, so, so, so they, we've been together on the journey from, from the very start. We, we did shop it around to other places and unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, we made this show very quickly, right? And that was the trade-off. We made it incredibly quick. And that was due to the, the budget constraints or, or due to budget the and time, budget and time okay. suffered for being able to being able to make the show. But in the end, you know, the, that's always the interesting thing in hindsight, you know, sometimes constraints make you more creative. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, was since there was a time constraint, was there an initial impulse to to make it? longer or, um, you, you know, I mean, to be frank, it could be continued and I'm sure other people have, have asked you, will there be a continuation? But, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? No, we're, it's a limited series, so it's sure. finished. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, this is the first week in Estee's life after leaving, right? Her, it could go a million ways. Um, and in a way, you know, whatever you want to ha happen with her, that could be the ending, but also, you know, it's, it's inspired by a real person. So I feel like, um, I think the conversations around it and the reading and the, and, you know, I feel like people have gotten really interested in this stuff who've watched the show and don't, didn't know much about it. I feel like that's kind of what it's about. But no, the answer is no, we won't be making a second season. I had a feeling, but I, you know, I'm sure people are interested. So I wanted to make sure to ask. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, I wanted to ask about uh, your experience as a woman in the industry. And now that, you know, you're seemingly more entrenched in, in Hollywood and in a place like Netflix, have you had, you know, have you had any challenges or, you know, issues be being a woman in the industry or do you feel like, you know, you, your career, it, which your success, you know, is an example of how women can succeed in the industry? I mean, all I can say that I feel really grateful to be a woman in this industry today and not one day before me. I think sure. it's... Um, getting better every day. Um, I've also had my challenges, but certainly not close to women who are older than me. Um, I've never had a super traumatizing or awful experience because I'm a woman. I've had to fight really hard and work really hard for everything. Um, I don't know if I can make that down to just to just the fact that I'm a woman or also just the fact that my interests span very widely. And for me, um, my path has never, has never been as clear as for other people who like, you know, they go to film school and then they make a short and then they, they make a couple of shorts and they make their narrative. Like for me, I've always been really interested in different types of storytelling, which makes a career quite complicated sometimes because people like clarity, people like formats, people want to know what you are and put you into a box. And so for me, I, you know, try to build a career in which I can explore different types of things. So um, I do feel like um, the art world is, uh, has been kinder to me as a woman filmmaker than the commercial world. I mean, Thank God we have things like organizations like Free the Bid or Free the Work these days. But, you know, um, 
Sure. Have I in my entire commercial career, like done a big car ad? Was I on track to do that? No, because, you know, the people who get the car ads are the dudes who have the car ads. Like it's, it's this kind of the car ad. I say that because that's like a staple in commercial video. Sure. Um, it, it, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. It's kind of horrific. Um, and, uh, but I, I do think that's changing. I really want to be optimistic that that's changing. And I think that we're in a really great moment right now to, um, you can tell just by going onto any of the streamers and seeing how many female, female characters and female storytellers there are. And that's, that's, yeah. key, that's key on your show. I mean, it's you know, two, two female co-creators and it's a female lead. Um, so it's, yeah, and a lot know. of our a lot of our department heads of department are women. Our directors are women. I mean, yeah, it was very important to us to to do that, um, and and not just out of spite, but just because this is a a sensitive story about a woman, and we genuinely believe that's what it needed. You know, um, so yeah, I think every woman in a male dominated industry <laughs> at some point suffers and needs to fight harder. Uh, just like, um, I mean, obviously we can go down the ladder. I mean, people of color, it's, it's, it, the numbers are, uh, the lack of people of color in this industry in, in leading roles in, in heads of department behind the camera is atrocious. So, um, I want to believe that it's getting better. I think it's getting better, but you know, uh, that's why the fact that you ask me this and this is a conversation is a sign of change, mm -hmm. right? Um, because a couple, of so. years ago, <laughs> a couple of years ago, it wouldn't have even come up. So, well, I'm I'm glad to see that you know your your success and you're only just getting started. So I'd love to hear you know it kind of looks like we're in your at home workspace. Uh, I don't know if we are, but I'd love to hear you know uh, what's next for you and if you've been working during the pandemic at all, whether it's prepping for your next show or writing something. Mm -hmm. I'm in development for a movie that I'm writing for myself. Um, I'm co-writing and um, I'm planting a couple of seeds. Um, I have twin one-year-olds, so uh, being locked in the same space with them as well as trying to, um, you know, develop and <laughs> write has been a bit of a challenge, sure. but I'm, I'm getting into the groove. Um, I'm really grateful in this time that I've gotten into writing because there's certainly no productions happening in the States, really. Um, and yeah, so that's what I, I, I can't, it always sounds so self-important to be like, I can't talk about that. It's just, no. I, I do believe in like kismet and the universe and not jinxing things. So it's just too soon. That's totally fine. Most, most people either have signed NDAs, even our visual effects alum, alumni, you know, yeah. have said, I can't say anything about the project. So we're just happy that you're, that you're working on, on what's next. And, um, you know, uh, I'd love for you to offer any sort of advice to uh, students who are watching or to people in the field who are looking to have the career you ha you've had, even though yours, you know, is multifaceted, but people who might be looking to either go into documentaries or to go into narrative series, what, what advice would you, would you give them? Um, uh, it's very hard to give, give one piece of advice to everybody. Um, you can give a, a bunch of small pieces of advice. To <laughs> right. I think it's like, being an unashamed hustler um, and doing whatever you need to do to build confidence, whether it be going to therapy or, <laughs> or just whatever. I think um, like confidence in yourself and in your ideas is really important and being like critical, um, you know, and I think to the students, um, I think, being at art school is a really great opportunity to um, 
to build a basis, a foundation for what you believe in and what you don't like. <laughs> and, um, but also be really, you know, be really open to, uh, I, I'd say, you know, and I've said a ton of things. I, I have to say like, be really open. You know, I've done so much crappy stuff in the interim and like things that I've really had to put my own snobbery aside and like for, you know, silly jobs and stuff. And, 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 and some of those things really do bring about something like a great connection or person or friend or whatever, you know, experience, or maybe you have a funny experience in a shitty job and that'll inspire you to write a show or like, who knows, you know, I, I really think we're in a really confusing time right now. So I think we need to be really open, you know, to, you know, to, for, for how inspiration can, um, yeah, can, missing the word. Can inspire. <laughs> can inspire. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, you know, we we have a lot of alumni who are working, but you know, we have many others who aren't, but who you know are creating personal work in the interim. So I think that's great to leave people. Yeah, with that. I think it's really great to reinvent all the time. You know, um, I think that's really great. Um, you know, I, I went I went to SVA because I, I thought it'd be a great tool to just learn how to do things myself. And it turned out that that was an important thing because at the end of the day, if need be, I can pick up my camera and go, you know, if, if, that, if that's what it comes back to. Sure, no, it's great. Um, well, I wanna thank you again for being here. Um, you know, we'll put a link to the trailer in the YouTube information. Um, but congratulations on the success of the series and we'll be rooting for you and the show on on the Emmy Awards night. Uh, so uh, best of luck, best of most best for the continued success of your career. And we look forward to seeing what's next. So uh, be you. well. Have a great one. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A and hope you'll check out our other after school special videos on the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thank you for your interest in and support of SVA and its alumni, and for your support of the arts in general. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well.